Hey everybody, we're back again for another Asus PC DIY Hardware live stream. It's me, JJ. Hopefully everybody's having a good Friday wrapping out the week on a positive and productive footing. Uh, this is going to be a pretty quick stream. I'm going to try to compress things down. Normally we run a little bit longer in terms of actually the PC DIY Hardware live stream, but I've got an appointment that I've got to go ahead and get to, but we've got actually a lot of exciting product announcements uh, for this week. So uh, we're actually going to be talking about the uh, long-awaited Wi-Fi 7 based router with the, of course, ROG Rapture, our latest ultra high-end flagship Wi-Fi 7 based unit. So if you're looking for the absolute best when it comes to, of course, Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 7, looking for 10G connectivity and ultra performant chipset. We're going to be talking about really some of the cool things that that router brings to the table and talking about, of course, its channel availabilities. I know a lot of people have been waiting for this guy. Uh, we're also going to talk about, actually about a brand new chassis that we're going to be coming out with shortly and actually follow up to our AP uh, 201 micro ATX chassis with the actual A21, which actually I really love. If you're looking for something a little bit larger, um, still has a great deal of flexibility like the AP201, um, comes in white, comes in black, and actually has a really nice price point. The actual A21 I think is going to be pretty sweet. So I think you guys are going to be pretty excited about that. Um, let me go ahead and make sure that looking good there on the audio side. We're good there on that side. Um, we're also going to actually be taking a little bit of a closer look at some of the cool updates that we've got in some of our peripheral lineup with new updated switch variants for the original ROG Azoth in black. Of course, we recently lost the ROG Azoth in white with the, of course, the snow and the storm switches. We'll re-highlight that. Uh, we have a switch update for the Claymore 2 as well as for the actual Flare 2 Animate. Uh, our Prime Series ATX 3.0 series power supplies are now finally available, so we'll give a quick little highlight to there. And then also the 1200 watt version version of the ROG Strix Aura power supply is going to be releasing and we have a final uh, launch pricing of course for the latest range of TRX 50 based motherboards so for those that are going to be building on Threadripper Threadripper Pro series product so we're going to get ready to jump into uh, quite a number of things let's quickly go ahead and see who we have joining us here on the stream today so let's see we've got uh, Lano C's joining us hey guys great website you guys looking for of course some great reviews on Asus hardware as well as for a lot of things make sure to go ahead and check out Lano C happy to have you joining us here Wes thanks so much We've got Michael joining us uh, from, of course, up north in Canada. Fantastic to have you here. We've got Pasquis also joining us. Got Pidgey PCs. Erica is joining us. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Erica. And also, thank you for letting us know that our audio is sounding good. We've got Michael joining us as well, man. Um, Michael's asking, hey, BTF chassis? Yeah, actually, the A21 is actually going to be the first BTF chassis on the market, supporting not only BTF-based motherboards, but traditional micro-ATX and mini-ITX-based motherboards. So we'll get to that. Uh, Jenny is also joining us. And then Michael's got a question right there. But uh, for everybody else joining us, man, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us. Michelle, thank you also for joining us here on the stream. Uh, let me quickly see what we've got here. Um, Halo JJ, question about the PG48UQ OLED monitor. Is it still being manufactured? Yes, it is still an active SKU. So uh, if anybody's wondering, the PG48UQ along with the 42UQ are essentially our large format OLED based displays. So we have now quite a number. We have 13 inches, we have 15 inches. Uh, we then move into, of course, the 27 inches, which we also now have the upcoming 32 inch refresh, which will be coming out in January. Then we also, of course, have an active 32 inch in terms of the Pro Art lineup, and then we have have uh, 42 and 48 and then we also recently launched the 49 so we've actually got quite a number but yes the 48 UQ is still available um, if you're not seeing availability uh, feel free to go ahead and email me pcdiy at asus.com and I'll see if I can double check with our account manager team on when they might expect the next refresh um, as far as actually uh, availability in terms of the product I know that we actually had some promo pricing on the UQ models during um, kind of Black Friday and Cyber Monday so you might have seen that kind of sell through and so it might have not been available if you were looking for it, but it is still an active production model okay all right and one more question because like i said we're going to try to keep it compact to be able to try to tackle everything i've got here um pickle juice uh i believe yeah pickle juice is saying not going to dream hack dj uh right now i have no plans the next time you guys will see me outside of the pc DIY stream uh, which we have at least one or two left for the remainder of the month will be of course at cs 2024 so if you guys are part of our pc DIY group check out the cs post that i have featured um i can't tell you about what we're going to announce but i can tell you now looking at our final product list um we're going to be looking at probably over probably 30 35 product announcements and some of them are absolutely awesome so if you're of course interested in the latest and greatest from asus you love pc hardware you're definitely going to want to keep it tuned for what we're going to have announcing uh, in cs 2024 all right so let's go ahead and uh, jump in from there 
I'll, I'll tackle this one question really quick. Arox goes, when more, will more devices be supported for the Omni receiver? Um, that's a little bit more tricky. The Omni receiver is actually based on the chipset that's utilized in the product. And so not every product can be retroactively added in because it actually actually has to meet um, interoperability standards with that, especially from a latency perspective. Um, one of the things that actually a lot of people don't realize when we designed and developed the Omni receiver is that there are other companies that have gone ahead and kind of, let's say, done sim some something similar as far as kind of offering, um, you know, of course, dual connection standard. But what some people don't realize is, is that the actual performance can be quite variable um, in terms of what you can actually really see or more so actually what you can't see, but what can be measured in terms of actually system latency. So an example right here, if we take a look at this, let me actually show you this uh, data. Take, for instance, here, this was a little bit of kind of in-house benchmarking that we did. Uh, we take actually the kind of the dual connection experience very seriously. So we're only kind of porting this over to units where we carefully evaluate the tuning for the actual chipset and making sure that we can really maximize not only the performance, the latency, but the battery life for the product. Uh, anytime you add essentially more hops or kind of more uh, communication to a wireless product, you're going to be affecting battery life. And of course, I don't think anybody wants to have a super big penalty to the battery life, right? So let's quickly take a look at this here. Let me go ahead and jump into this and I'll show you. So here's an example a little bit if we take a look at what we actually have been doing to kind of pay attention to really kind of monitor this. So when we first launched the actually um, the Omni connection essentially protocol or implementation, it was with the Scope 2 96 base keyboard and the ROG Harp, right? And you can actually see right here with some other competitors, you can see that, hey, one keyboard connected to one dongle, it's not even always one millisecond for takes, for instance, the keyboard. Our keyboard was one millisecond. These competitors right here were actually 3.4, 3.5 milliseconds. And then you can also see similarly for the mouse, it could vary, right? One millisecond, 3.5. We were actually sub one millisecond, outstanding low level latency, right? So 0.80 milliseconds, right? So that's really, really good. Now, of course, it gets more interesting. Let's look at one keyboard plus one mouse connected to essentially one adapter, right? So that's gonna be the Omni receiver. Uh, we can see here, Asus is really the absolute best, right? So going in at one millisecond and 1.4 milliseconds with the two devices in concert, um, because it's exceedingly difficult to be able to maintain a uniform one millisecond for both. And you can see there, we're not even able to 100% do that, right? But very, very close to at least maintaining one millisecond for both devices, right? Where you can see with this competitor, it's considerably over, right? 2.69 milliseconds, 3.1, Five one milliseconds, and then of course you can also see here a big lopsided, of course, aspect in terms of the keyboard. So, again, it is something that we're closely kind of looking at, but we want to make sure that we can maximize the performance. But you will see more announcements uh, over the coming weeks, uh, over the coming kind of quarter, as far as for which models we can do. And I would say if models do have them featured uh, for that, it will probably first and foremost any products that have Speed Nova based chipsets, which are only our latest generation based product, as opposed to the older chipsets that were present in those units. So again, we don't want to compromise on latency. So hopefully that answers that question gives you a little bit more context into some kind of things that we have to keep in mind, okay? Um, hey, Liquified Mods, man, happy to have you here. So let's get ready to jump into it, guys. We've got a lot to jump jump into, so I'm going to go ahead and start with, I think, um, let's go with a really easy one. We're going to do the ROG Hone Ace XXL desk mat, and then I'm going to let you guys decide, do you want to go into the A21 chassis, which I'm really excited about, or do we do the, actually, the ROG Rapture, the GTE uh, excuse me, the GT BE98 Pro. So let me know which one you guys have a preference for in terms of going into. But first, we're going to do the ROG Hone Ace XXL. So this is our latest desk mat. So XXXL, I call it a desk mat as opposed to, of course, a mouse pad. But of course, it is also a mouse pad. So we already have the sheath and the scabbard, um, scabbard 2 which are essentially large kind of XX, XXL based desk mats. So if you're somebody that wants essentially coverage for both kind of your keyboard and your mouse and maybe a little bit of extra space there, this is definitely what you're going to be looking at. So let's take a look here at the ROG Hone XXL. And this will be a fabric based mouse pad as opposed to, of course, in our last stream, we talked about um, the uh, Moonstone, which is an XL based mouse pad, but it's glass. So if you guys didn't check that out, make sure to go ahead and check out the uh, Moonstone. It's really nice. I had the chance to finally uh, get hands on with it and I was really impressed with it. So that is going to be uh, the Moonstone. So let's go ahead and take a look right here. This is going to be the desk mat. Um, it has a really, really, really nice uh, kind of thickness, so three millimeters, so that it's actually not too thick. So it still allows for kind of a comfortable level of kind of lip to desk 
Z height. So in terms of kind of you just moving over, it feels nice and, and solid. Uh, there, not too high. Um, also has a really, really nice, of course, uh, polyurethane-based base there. So to be able to make sure that you get really nice adhesion to your desk, so you don't have to worry about kind of it moving or slipping or sliding or anything like that. Uh, the actual uh, Construction is really nice and high quality, so you don't have to worry about kind of fraying on the edges. Now, one of the other things that we've also spent time to do in terms of the design and development is similar to what we've done with the scabbards, is that this does actually have a protective top layer coating. The top layer coating not only allows for, I think, a really, really nice kind of smooth level of tracking performance while still maintaining the benefit of a textile, right, where you get improved kind of control along with kind of gliding performance, but it's also going to help to resist kind of dust, debris, dander, and even liquids. So it's not going to be, of course, as extreme in terms of kind of its protection or uh, the ability to kind of prohibit anything kind of getting inside of it in the same way that a glass or a hard surface would be. So like our Moonstone or with the Baltius. But um, it definitely is going to be better than your traditional mouse pads where definitely if you spill something in it, it soaks straight in there. Dust, debris, dander, sweat, all that stuff just kind of seeps in there and it increases the likelihood of one affecting the performance, um, but also uh, becomes just more, more kind of an issue over time that you have to factor on how easily you can clean this. With the nano coating that you have there, it just makes it easier that you can pretty much kind of wipe it with a light kind of damp terry cloth and if you do that, you're pretty much going to be keeping it clean uh, pretty easily. So really nice, clean, refined, minimal design. Right now, it only comes in just this black variant, uh, but I think it looks fantastic. Um, great option right there, like I said, if you want to be able to have a lot of space, be able to go ahead and make your adjustments for your keyboard, your mouse. You want to be able to lay down your headsets, you know, your phone. You don't want to scuff or scratch anything like that on your surface. So that's the ROG Hone Ace XXL coming in at $60. Expect the availability to probably be, like I said, somewhere within the next seven to about 30 days, depending on the e-tailer. I would expect initial av availability will probably be quickest on the Asus store, then probably followed up by Newegg uh, for those of you who are interested in picking it up, okay? Um, and for anybody wondering in terms of the overall color, as of right now, the only color that we're going to have is just black. Um, we have kind of tried to offer different color variations for different products, um, whether it's like the Moonstone, which you can get in white and you can get in black. The scabbard only comes in one color. The sheath actually comes in four different colors. So if you're interested in seeing a color, feel free and let us know. We'd love to be able to kind of see if we can find kind of that sweet spot in terms of offering more choice, while at the same time making sure that we're offering a product that I think um, the majority of people are interested in. Okay. So that is going to be the ROG Hone XXL desk mat, all right? And for reference there, I just wanted to show you guys the Moonstone. That is the Moonstone. Again, that's our XL mouse mat or, or you know, uh, mouse pad, but this is gonna be Brasilla tempered glass. So really, really nice high quality grass um, and has, like I said, an XL form factor. If you're somebody that wants the absolute easiest surface to clean, um, you want super smooth tracking performance. Um, also, it actually has a special coating to mitigate kind of noise or squeaking. If you've ever kind of sometimes taken certain items and you kind of rubbed it over glass, you can sometimes get squeaking or noise. And so we actually had to put in a specialized coating, which one gives it a little bit of a soft feel to it, but also helps to reduce any kind of audible kind of high level noise. So that is going to be, again, the RG Hone XXL. All right. Uh, Zach notes, why no white? Um, I already kind of just talked about that. So again, right now we have no plans for it, but, you know, make sure to always keep it tuned. If we do decide to come out with one, we will let you guys know. All right. So very, very cool. And that is going to be the RG Hone XXL. So let's see what we had in terms of feedback. Um, Aerox is going, you guys love using the Felshion in your promo shots. Um, well, we have, all, I've got all kinds of promo shots. I've got promo shots with the Azoth. Uh, I've got shots with the Scope 2. We've got one more shots with all of our keyboards. So um, we like the Felshion, but, um, you know, we actually like all our keyboards. Um, so let's go ahead and see here. Uh, from feedback, what did we get? Uh, we got the 98 Pro, the 98 right um and greg hey happy thanks for joining us fantastic to have you here so it sounds like uh i didn't see any thoughts for the a21 sadly so it looks like we're probably going to end up doing the router so let's get ready to jump straight into the router all right so this is going to be again the rg rapture gtbe 98 pro wi-fi 7 router so we had already gone ahead and released the be 96 which is not under the rg lineup it's just our asus rt series router i still think that is a fantastic choice it's going to offer you really really impressive throughput i mean with uh, paired with a wi-fi 7 client you could be looking at two three four uh, even five gigabits of actually wireless throughput it's got 10g lan it has an ultra high performance uh 
quad core based architecture in terms of the chipset, one gigabyte worth of memory. Um, but when we now step into the BE98 Pro, it's really gonna kind of take things to a whole nother level, not only in terms of the performance, but in terms of the actual feature set. So let's quickly go ahead and take a look at some of the core items. And also for people that are interested, a couple of things that I will go ahead and note is that um, we will actually have a focus stream just on Wi-Fi 7 and our Wi-Fi 7 routers more in January. So if you're kind of maybe kind of waiting to figure out which model I might want to buy, factoring in kind of certain other kind of points in terms of client interoperability, performance considerations, whether you might do mesh, because these units do support AI and mesh, we're going to have a focus stream just talking about Wi-Fi 7 based routers and kind of some of the more nitty and gritty, because that can be a little bit more complicated to kind of compress into our weekly stream here where we cover a lot of different products. Um, but that being noted, I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the high level items right here. So first and foremost, this is going to step up to be a quad band based unit. So the BE96 was three bands. This is going to be four bands. So when we break that down from, of course, a throughput perspective, you can actually see that broken down per your band. So 2.4, which 2.4 is going to be for the vast majority of the devices that we still connect. Of course, that can be everything from, you know, your consoles to your TVs, phones, laptops, a lot of internet of things kind of based devices. So if you have like a smart refrigerator, security cameras, the thermostats, um, baby monitors, right? A lot of kind of standardized kind of general Wi-Fi enabled products are still at 2.4 because they offer the longest range and generally the best battery life. Five gigahertz, of course, has been out for years and can exist, uh, of course, for quite a number of devices, though you tend to usually see it more in a more performant based device. So usually kind of in laptops, um, selected TVs, consoles, things along those lines are going to start moving into five gigahertz, as well as, of course, motherboards. Six gigahertz is going to be exclusive to the latest generation of products. So Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, and Wi-Fi 7 enabled products. So Wi-Fi 7 right now, pretty much the only thing on the market with Wi-Fi 7 is our latest generation of motherboards and brand new laptops just right now starting to come to the market. Beyond that, really, you're going to see a lot more Wi-Fi 7, of course, moving into next year. And of course, there are now select phones, including phones like our own ROG Phone 7, which actually have Wi-Fi 7. Um, but you definitely want to check on the actual chipset because uh, take, for instance, like the latest generation iPhones or Wi-Fi 6E, latest generation Google Pixel phones have uh, Wi-Fi 7. Um, other phones from other manufacturers as well, they have varying chipsets. So if you want to find out what to kind of pair with, um, do kind of keep that in mind. But Wi-Fi 6, uh, in terms of Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, you really want to leverage these Wi-Fi 6 bands to get a huge amount of your throughput. So that's going to be one of the big things is you see 30 gigabits of total kind of quote unquote available bandwidth. Now that's a hypothetical number for you. What you really should kind of be concerned with is thinking about when I actually connect my device in a kind of an optimal range, what's the speed that I could legitimately be seeing? So on, let's say a six gigahertz band, right now here you can see your th theoretical maximum is 1.5, right, megabits, right? Or 1.5 gigabits, right? Um, in that respect, you can legitimately be looking at 4.5, 5.5, almost six gigabits of effective throughput in a real world situation. So taking something like a Wi-Fi 7 enabled phone, a Wi-Fi 7 enabled motherboard, a Wi-Fi 7 enabled laptop, um, in that about kind of 10 to 20 feet range, you're literally talking about the speed of four to five times the speed of a gigabit ethernet cable. So really, really impressive. Now, one of the other really cool things that we've done with this generation unit is that the actual core antenna has been entirely redesigned for even a higher level of signal performance. Some people have a misconception that think you kind of have to go to mesh to have really, really broad coverage, and that's actually not true. Um, a high performance router can actually easily offer coverage up, you know, in a 2400, 2500, 2800, 3000 square foot home, even two stories. Take for instance me, I've got about a 2800 square foot plus home, two story environment, and I actually connect all my devices via just one router. Um, and that would include both stories, my actually my patio and my backyard, my garage are all covered with one single router. Now, if I even wanted broader coverage, or maybe you want even enhance maybe what we call last mile coverage. So generally kind of the the last 20% of wherever your space is that you want to cover. That's where generally mesh can provide an advantage. But if we consider the way that wireless works in terms of mesh compared to a traditional router, this is something you want to keep in mind. When we talk about bands, having more bands is going to give you more flexibility for wireless performance. A traditional dual band mesh, which would be 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, is actually only one single band because one of the bands will be lost to connect the two mesh nodes together. So you actually only have one band. Now, depending on what you set up, 
you could be either losing the five gigahertz band or you could be losing the two gigahertz band, 2.4 gigahertz band. Most times you're gonna lose the five gigahertz band because that's what the two nodes will use together because it's faster to connect those two, give you a bigger pipeline and stabilize and improve the performance for that 2.4. If you have three bands, you can see that now you get a benefit, right? Because you could have maybe let's say like the five gigahertz band used to connect those two or the six gigahertz band to connect those two and you have two bands left. Within a quad band, it's really ideal for actually mesh. So it's kind of really future-proof ready if you really want super large coverage because you can actually take one of those bands and still have three available, including that six gigahertz high-speed band. Now, these units also do support what's called a wired backhaul, which means that you can actually connect the two routers together through high-speed based ethernet. Um, so that is an option to actually give you all your bands exposed, but still connect the two routers together. All ASUS AI mesh products allow for both. You can do wireless backhauls or you can do wired backhauls. So they give you the flexibility for both. But in terms of the antenna, if you're actually to take apart a traditional antenna, you would generally only have actually one, actually uh, what's called kind of endpoint in terms of actually the reception for the feed for your actually wireless signal. Um, but here we actually have two feeds and this actually helps to further improve what's called TX and RX performance, the overall kind of signal performance that you have with your client devices. So ultimately just giving you better signal range, better signal stability, and ultimately a more performant experience for Wi-Fi. So this is pretty cool because traditionally you will not see this, like I said, in standard routers is having a dual feed antenna design, where in this model you do have a dual feed antenna design. Now, in terms of the chipset, this thing is an absolute monster. It's 2.6 gigahertz quad core 64 bit SOC that's on here, an ultra high level of DDR4 memory that's also built in to allow for the highest level of performance. Literally, you can handle hundreds of devices, but also more critically, it helps to ensure the best performance for when it's really being saturated or heavily hit. Um, the lower the chipset is, the more that the IO performance and the device handling performance can be brought down. Um, without getting kind of super technical, an example of this is if you take an M.2 SSD and you were to actually measure your CPU utilization, your CPU can actually affect the performance of that M.2 SSD, especially with higher performing Gen 4 and even Gen 5 based drives. Similarly, same thing with the USB bus. If you send a lot of data, you'll actually see your CPU spike because there's a lot of IO requests that the CPU has to process. And so having a faster performing chipset helps to essentially manage high speed connections and give you a higher level of performance. It also unlocks better performance for things like 10 speed networking, um, also for things for like on router VPN performance. These are all significantly improved and also different configurations where um, things like PPOE E uh, performance, which historically is quite hard on routers, is significantly better than it would be in prior generations. But if we take a look here at the rear side I.O., really, really nice in terms of, of course, uh, kind of being ready right now for the absolute best, but also ready for the future. So you can see that you've got dual 10G ports that are going to be on here, including actually a 10G port that is flexible for a WAN port. So that means that the input for your internet service can actually be up to 10G. So it supports 1G, 2.5G, 5G, 10G connectivity, all of those are supported. You then also have a direct 10G LAN so that if you wanted to wire that into like a NAS, a laptop, a desktop, a mini PC system, you could go ahead and do that. You can also use a 10G to 10G based backend, right? For like I said, a wired backhaul. And then the other really cool part is 2.5G being really prevalent amongst our motherboards, our mini PCs, laptops, and other products is you actually have four 2.5G ports, right? So again, dual 10G, quad 2.5G, and then an additional 1G LAN port. So you've got tons of connectivity on here. And then the USB performance, you'll see that with our latest ASUS WRT firmware, we enabled support for tethered uh, internet service, essentially support with Android or iOS that if you want to have a 4G or 5G cellular connection fed into your router, you can do that by literally just taking a cable, plugging your phone, and then all of a sudden you can share your cellular service across all your devices. That's a really cool kind of backup benefit. If maybe your ISP provider went down and your cellular provider was still up, you could immediately power your router and have all your devices connected, still have an internet signal. Um, that comes to you no cost. That's built in base free within the firmware. Uh, the other performance benefit too is really, really impressive USB performance. Um, with like NTFS, uh, FAT32, you're looking at, you know, I think conservatively upwards of almost two, probably like 150 to almost 200 megabytes a second 
for read performance and then write performance is probably a bit lower somewhere probably between about like 120 to like 150 megabytes so you're talking real nas level performance from the usb port on this unit so if you wanted to kind of use it as a local kind of nas box or like create your own kind of little storage cloud that you can also do through the asus firmware and through our supporting software then you've got a lot of flexibility that you can see as being a 42 that you shouldn't just be looking at this as a wi-fi router but you should really be looking at this as kind of like a hub for really defining the experience for your network whether it's going to be wired whether it's going to be usb or whether it's going to be wi-fi okay um, now, of course, this being a gaming unit, it has tons of gaming related features, like you've got a dedicated gaming port, which will automatically prioritize any hardware based devices. So if you plugged like an Xbox, a PS5, a Switch, your gaming PC, you don't even have to configure anything in the router, it'll automatically prioritize that as the primary device. It also does prioritization to specific packets that are more gaming sensitive. Gaming doesn't use a lot of bandwidth, but it's more latency sensitive. Um, we have tons of options that are available to you within our quality service menu that you can go in and you can prioritize gaming, streaming, downloading, you know, all kinds of different types of scenarios, right? Video conferencing. You can go in there and on the fly do that all within the router app. You can prioritize devices. You can see what's called per packet data analysis, which is pretty crazy. We're like, if you wanted to see how every device on your network is using your data um, and where it's making connections to and how much is being used for what and when you can see all that you could literally go let me see this laptop and then let me see actually how much it's using for steam how much it's using for netflix how much it's using for youtube it breaks it down to in a pie graph chart we have this really deep kind of data analysis inspection that's all available to you really really robust our subscription policy also for security is all built in and at and no cost to you. Some other companies, they charge you like a continual licensing fee that you have to pay if you want some advanced kind of security protection on the router. That comes at no cost. You just have to turn the functionality on. And there's a lot of really advanced logic that we have built in to kind of safeguard you from like botnets and uh, a lot of different type of kind of networking attacks that can kind of happen to your system there. So the other really cool last item that I just want to touch on is that we've added in for for years um, but you know recently we even kind of took things further where we have really i think the best in class vpn level support the reality is a lot of users used to kind of buy third-party firewalls or run kind of third-party ecosystems of firmware to be able to do what we're doing directly all within the router but you can see right here you have full vpn support for ppt excuse me for pptp OpenVPN, IPsec, and even WireGuard. WireGuard probably being the fastest and the best of those VPN-based kind of protocols and servers. Um, and the really cool thing is that if you've ever run a, a VPN on a router, the performance that you're gonna get with this much newer chipset is truly impressive. Literally, we've had this feature on routers for years, and if you took this and you did this from like a router from like two years ago, three years ago, the performance delta could literally be easy be a factor of like two to three to four X higher performance, even with VPN enabled, where like before, if you would enable the VPN, you could take a really, really big hit on your throughput performance. So it's quite impressive. So again, you really get what you pay for in terms of kind of the performance and the feature set. Now, again, do you need to jump all the way to something like this? No, we talked about previously, like our Tough Gaming AX6000, which you know is like a $200 router. It's got 2.5G ports on it. Great Wi-Fi 6 based chipset, um, high speed chipset as well to be able to enable a lot of features and functions. And that's going to give you a really great experience, right? So you don't necessarily need to go and get something like this to have a great Wi-Fi experience. But for those that really want the absolute best, the absolute fastest connections, you have the most um, kind of recent devices, you've got 10G based networks, you want to be able to take advantage of things like VPN, then, you know, it's definitely a model to consider. But also I would probably still be taking a look at the BE96U, which is the tri-band based model, which is definitely also a bit cheaper. Now, um, before I kind of uh, move on from that, I quickly want to see, we see that there's a lot of questions that kind of came up in there in the chat. So let me just see if we've got anybody that might've had any questions. Um, Michael goes, love the VPN option uh, with Surfshark. Yeah, the cool thing is that it's agnostic. You can use any VPN based client you want. Uh, excuse me, that you want, you just load in the information. And the cool part about that is instead of you having to locally run like a, a VPN on every device, 
every device that's connected to the router can benefit from the VPN. And you can also do what we call as VPN fusion. So VPN fusion actually allows you to split your connection so that if you want maybe some devices to be able to connect without the VPN associated to it, you can do that. And then you can have another essentially connection that's in place for devices to work through the VPN. Um, and the reason why, of course, is that generally through the VPN connection, you'll usually get it, take a hit a little bit, maybe in latency, you'll take a, a hit in terms of total throughput. So it being kind of beneficial to be able to have more flexibility to split between the two, right? Um, Darren goes, how many devices can it handle? I know most are recommended about 25-ish. No, definitely not. Um, it actually really depends on the total throughput that you're looking for. Uh, the reality is that I would say with any modern high performance quad core based chipset, which would really cover actually routers down to the probably about, um, I'd say probably about the $250 in upcast, you're locking, you're, you can easily be talking, you know, 75, 150, 200 plus clients, but it depends of course, on what that client is doing, right? So you, a vast majority of the devices you might have connected might be, like I said, more IoT based devices. So if you talk about a security camera, like so here, I've got security cameras that I might have here that are on a 2.4 gigahertz connection, and they're really only selling small data packets incrementally, right? Or, you know, my uh, my Ecobee for my smart thermostat, you could add in, you know, maybe 30 devices that are all connected, and they're all just barely using much throughput, and they're not actively sustained. That's quite different than you maybe having like, okay, I've got three 4K TVs and associated stream boxes, a console, two laptops and four phones, and a lot of those devices are persistently all being connected. If you talk about the total bandwidth that's available, again, you've got uh, up to that theoretical 30,000, right? So you've got more than enough bandwidth for literally hundreds of devices, right? They can all be connected. Probably in most situations, your limiting factor is gonna be more so your internet service provider than the router would be in that configuration, okay? Um, let me go ahead and quickly see if there was any other questions in there. Um, Michael goes, will the USB support a 2.55 gigahertz USB adapter? No, it's not designed for that. It is, it, it, the adapter is designed either one for storage devices or, like I said, for tethering purposes. So to connect your phone, right, for either 4 or 5G based tethering, okay? Uh, Michael goes, yes, dual, uh, dual WAN 10G. Um, you can have a dual WAN. All of our ASUS routers pretty much all support an option for dual WAN provisioning within the WRT firmware, but by default, it is not specced as a dual 10G WAN based model. Okay, so default, you have one 10G WAN. Okay. Uh, Jenny goes, uh, dual six gigahertz band. Nice. Yeah, I definitely agree. That's a, it's a very, very nice feature, right? Um, so. I'll go ahead and go one more question right here. Um, let's see. So should the speed be feasible with an Intel BE Wi-Fi card speeds on the low five gigahertz band are faster? No, uh, generally six gigahertz band is always gonna be faster. With a five gigahertz connection, you're generally not gonna even break 1000 megabits in terms of your overall throughput. Um, so it is definitely, if you wanna have the best performance, you need to be on the six gigahertz band. Now. One other thing to keep in mind though, is that currently still, because the drivers and the OS model are still kind of in ratified, excuse me, in a ratification standard, they haven't been formally initialized, is that you wanna keep in mind that the Wi-Fi 7 driver hasn't officially been kind of fully enabled, right? And even for certain like phones or devices, it might require specific OTA updates from that vendor to facilitate enabling Wi-Fi 7 support completely. You also want to be cautious that some Wi-Fi 7 based clients might support 160 megahertz operation and others would support 320 megahertz operation and that will affect the peak total throughput and performance. At the end of the day, um, none of that is super critical because even if your kind of OS and your driver and everything like that isn't fully let's say enabled for Wi-Fi 7, it would essentially kind of fall back to work at a maximum of Wi-Fi 6E, which would still be very, very performant. You'd still be ultimately looking somewhere at around, you know, 1.2 to about 1.5 gigabits plus of throughput. So still even faster than an ethernet cable, right? Uh, excuse me, gigabit ethernet cable, okay? So that is going to be the BE98 Pro Wi-Fi 7, okay? So. Uh, Greg goes, so how do I win all this stuff? Um, you know, make sure to actually take advantage of the giveaways. We run giveaways almost monthly. We've done tons of them ready this year. Um, you know, we've literally done hundreds of thousands of dollars of giveaways, right? Um, it's impossible to, you know, um, do that every single month. But, you know, collectively across the entirety of the year, we really do a huge amount um, in terms of actually giveaways for hardware. And right now we're actually still doing Upgrade Palooza. So if you're not actually in on that giveaway, take advantage of that right now because it's happening right now. Okay.
All right, so let's go ahead and go from there. And again, if anybody has any other questions there in terms of the BE98 Pro, let me know. In terms of the overall respective timeline for availability, um, you're probably gonna be looking at, like I said, very end of this month, of course, with holidays for some uh, e-tail partners that could be affecting their listing and their release schedule for it. So it could roll over into kind of earlier January. But as of right now, we're getting ready pretty much to ship out the unit. Um, we're finalizing pretty much launch firmware for the unit as well. So the expectation is overall availability to be in alignment towards the very end of this month, moving into January. As always, when we talk about our product releases here on the stream, you're generally gonna be targeting about a seven to 30 day release window depending on the channel partner because it will vary you know new eggs different than bnh and that's different from micro center different from amazon different from the asus store generally though um for most situations the asus store and new egg are usually the fastest to get up new products skewed in and that's usually like i said between about seven to ten days okay all right and uh just because i don't think anybody asked but uh, i'll go ahead and just clarify um this is RGB on this unit, and so it is fully controllable right here. And some people wonder, is this kind of, is there a functional element? The unit actually has to have a very, very advanced high performance based heatsink design. So there is uh, part of the sizing is actually also just accounting for the totality of all the chipsets that we have to have in there and also all the thermal solutions that we have to have in there. There's actually a lot of heat sinks inside of this router. Um, you don't realize it even on motherboards that have 10G based chipsets on the motherboard, but we even have to have heat sinks on motherboards for the 10G chipset. So you having essentially a high performance switch, multiple 10G ports, the high speed memory that's on there, then the high speed quad core SOG chipset. There's actually a lot that you actually have to manage for thermal dissipation performance, especially with stability under load because nobody generally turns a router off. It usually is running indefinitely, right? You turn it on and it's running consistently. Um, so it is something that we have to kind of be cognizant of in terms of ensuring long-term reliability and stability. All right. So let's go into the next unit here. We're gonna talk about one of my favorite new additions that we've got, which is actually going to be the A21 chassis. Um, this is a really cool addition that we're gonna have coming out. So if you guys know, uh, we have the actual AP201, uh, which is a more compact micro ATX chassis. It's actually one of my favorite chassis that we offer. And we are now going to be having another uh, micro ATX chassis. Now, of course, this being micro ATX, it means you can fully support mini ITX as well. It's a little bit larger, so if you want a little bit more of a visual presentation to your system, then this would be a great option. Um, now, the AP201 was already pretty impressive because you could already support pretty much fit any GPU that we had on the market, including big cards like our Tough Gaming, our Strix. It had 360 millimeter support, so this is pretty much going to be that same, just kind of leveling up to even have a little bit more options for kind of visible, I think, spacing, and of course, just accessories as well as additional kind of airflow although again ap201 was all fully mesh on all sides 57,000 holes it had very very good porosity very impressive airflow um, but here's the white variant excuse me the black variant and we also will have a white variant you can see of course right up in the front you're going to have the option to have of course up to three fans At the top you can do a full 360 millimeter aio 380 millimeters in terms of the gpu support so this can easily support again our largest graphics card so a tough gaming 4080 tough gaming 4090 and rg strix 4080 or 4090 fully fits in here the other cool part is actually going to be that this chassis also supports our btf based standard um, so if you're not aware for btf btf means that essentially you have the support for essentially the rear cable motherboard design and how that lays out so if we take a look here at kind of the chassis you can see in the back you got tons of airflow this is really designed to be an airflow focused chassis um, and have also i think a, a refined clean aesthetic right um, when we move over to the side panel right you can see we got of course just huge amount of mesh the porosity on this which is going to uh, of course dictate the airflow performance is also very very high on this chassis top io you can see two type a ports and then type c and along your power button now pricing as you can see is really really good it's only 70 dollars, so not expensive at all um, for a very flexible and nice chassis in terms of all the support that you have and the high airflow focus right and let me see here right here you can of course see the tempered glass side panel that you have available to you on the, on the unit inside you've got all those nice cable routing holes now here you're going to see a little bit more holes than you might traditionally see in a standard chassis and that's because it supports the btf based design so you can use standard matx based motherboards but you can also use btf based motherboards now we have not started shipping those btf based motherboards but if you're not aware let me just show you an example of one of kind of the btf based boards in the micro atx space 
this would be a BTF based board. So an example is here, you actually don't see any, any of the connectors on here, correct? There's no connectors on there. Um, and so when we go to the back of the motherboard, you'll actually see all of the connectors. So there's your kind of EPS, there's your fan, there's your ARGB, there's the 24, right? There's all, all the connectors there on the back. So this chassis is already designed for this. So if you're looking for a really compact, clean design where you don't want to see those cables, this chassis can do that for you, but it can also look fantastic with, with a traditional base um, uh, MATX or mini ITX base motherboard where you have your traditional cables out coming from the front of the motherboard. So both are going to be supported on this chassis. Okay. Now uh, let me go back here in terms of just the, the, the chaser. And I've also got some great photos here from Mr. Matt Lee, who's done a build in this. Um, you can actually check out a video on his YouTube channel if you guys want to check it out. But um, you can see right here, again, uh, uh, not so nice space down here, big cabinet space down at the bottom, so you don't really have to worry about your PSU. You still have some optional support there for traditional hard drives or SSDs, and the SSD tray that's also right there, you're all going to be good to go. And the other thing is for the white variant, um, just like what we've done with many of our chassis where I think we're, we're really bringing kind of a high attention to detail is you will have essentially kind of color coded cables, right? Excuse me, not color coded cables, but the cables themselves um, are pretty much going to be the same. You're going to also get white cables on the interior. So if we go really quickly here and we go into our white model, a lot of vendors sometimes one, their white interior, it's not even all white. It might be black here you can actually see that it's fully white and again even all of our cables that were coming in are all white so you really get that really nice bold bright clean aesthetic so it is very 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 complimentary there so let's go ahead and uh, lastly just look at a couple of things right here we'll show a quick build photo and that will kind of wrap things up on the a21 so again it's designed for btf you can see an example of all the hardware you could fit in here right so there we've got our tough gaming I think this might be a B650 base motherboard. Um, you can see our Ryogen uh, cooler that's in there. Of course, you can see a full large Strix graphics cards in there, three fans that are going to be in there, and then a rear fan. And it looks really nice and complete in terms of the overall D design. So overall, really, really nice in terms of the overall kind of layout, the airflow, the visual aesthetic that you have there, right? So uh, let's take a look here, I believe, at uh, Mr. Matt Lee's build, and I'll quickly see if anybody has any quick questions that kind of came up. So again, you can see right here, high level porosity on all that airflow going on. Really nice looking build for Mr. Matt Lee. I believe this is with a the BTF-based motherboard, Ryogen 3 also on here, and I think this is uh, 4070 Ti, our Tough Gaming graphics card. Um, and then I think this is also with our Tough Gaming Gold Series PSU, which I really love those cables. Those cables on the Tough Gaming Series look really, really nice. Okay. All right. So that is going to be the Chaser A21. Let me quickly see if anything came up there. Um, I need a silence case. Um, really, actually, any case can really be silent. It really comes down to more of the components that you pick, the fan curve and the fans, right? So a lot of times, if you're generally keeping your fans under 1200 RPM, um, better quality fans, even 1400 RPM, you probably won't hear them and it would be quite quiet. Um, if you want something that's really quiet, uh, you might want to consider looking at something like, excuse me, our uh, <clears throat> our upcoming PA-682, which is going to be coming out next month. Um, but even actually our GT-502 and our GT, excuse me, 501, I think would be great, great options. But again, really, it's going to come down to the components you pick. If you pick like a nice graphics card like ours that have really good quality coolers, again, they have zero dB operating mode, so the fans are not even going to load when you're just watching a website, we're reading a website, looking at pictures, doing light gaming, and then even under gaming load, you know, the fans could be maybe like a 25, 26 dB, so effectively almost inaudible. So really actually it comes down to more the components you pick than I would say saying that the chassis influences that because even having a high mesh type chassis doesn't necessarily mean that it will be loud. Um, sure, if you want a little bit kind of more isolation, then look at something like I'd say like probably like the GT502 or the GT501 that we offer. I think those would be nice options for you, okay? Uh, Michael gives some feedback. He goes, looks nice. Uh, the MATX and the BTF right there. Um, what CPU is a good old CPU? That's kind of tricky, right? It really depends on what your use case is. Um, you know, I think 
Still, if you have something in the generation like a Ryzen 3600, which would definitely be pretty, pretty old, it's still actually a pretty capable CPU. Same thing on the Intel side, if you have something like, you know, like a 9900K, 9700K, something like that, that's still a very solid CPU, even though there's now multiple generations behind. But again, it really kind of comes down to, um, you know, the the performance and the feature set that you're kind of looking for within the applications and the games that you're that you're playing, right? So let me go ahead and just see there if any other quick questions on the A21. Doesn't look like it. So again, $70 for the white or for the black version gonna be coming in, like I said, um, very end of this month, beginning of next month for the A21, okay? So BTF compatible and standard compatible. And just make sure to go ahead and keep in mind that again, um, uh, availability, like I said, probably like I said, 77 to 30 days out in terms of kind of your resident time frame. Okay. So that is going to be the tough gaming, excuse me, the, uh, <laughs> the Asus at A21 chassis. All right. So we got the Rapture. We got the A21. We got the Haruji Own XL. Um, I've got one really basic update right here. This is one's going to be super quick. So let me go ahead and just bring this one up here. Now, uh, many of you, and I'd love to know in the chat if maybe you already have one, we already launched essentially the Tough Gaming um, A1 SSD enclosure where we also actually have the ROG Arion. So both of those are M.2 SSD enclosures where they're 10 gigabits and you just add your own M.2 SSD. For some people out there that maybe want a more streamlined experience and don't even want to add it, we are going to be releasing the um, AES 1000, which is essentially the same enclosure, but it just will ship with a one terabyte M.2 SSD. So um, you have that option if you're looking for it. Um, one thing that I'll note is that the outstanding really kind of durability of the Tough Gaming enclosure, this thing, you can drop it. You can, I mean, we've done some pretty crazy stuff with it in terms of, you know, dropping it, freezing it, you're submerging it in water. Um, I'm a really big fan that if you're buying kind of other options that might exist in the marketplace from, you know, SanDisk or Western Digital, um, you know, crucial. They're all great options, but most of them are never designed to be open to service. So I'm a really big fan of our Arion or our Tough Gaming enclosure option because you could buy whatever size SSD you want. And then even a year down the road, uh, you could just reopen it up and you could upgrade to a two terabyte or to a four terabyte. But if you're looking essentially for a model that already has a pre-installed essentially M.2 SSD one terabyte, then this would be the AS1000. So that is going to be an option for you there. All right. Now, uh, for those of you that are looking for a maybe a strong value monitor, maybe you're just building your first system, maybe you're looking for an upgrade for a friend that doesn't have a huge amount of money. This is actually a really nice option that I'm excited about right here, which is going to be the Tough Gaming. We've actually refreshed quite a number of uh, Tough Gaming based monitors recently. But the great thing about this display is that it's coming in at, you know, 200 and essentially $20. And if you consider the performance and the spec, it's really solid. So 27 inches, 1080p, 180 hertz. This is also a fast IPS display. A lot of times uh, within this kind of price band, you were looking at generally an older IPS based display, um, which would have a higher pixel response time. So here you're going to get a faster panel with that higher refresh rate and also a lower pixel response time. Uh, you have formal G-Sync compatibility, variable overdrive, which is pretty rare for more entry-level monitors. Variable overdrive just helps to ensure better motion clarity throughout the refresh rate range. Because when you're playing a game, you could be like at 60, 80, 90, 120, 180 Hertz, and the monitor needs to make adjustments to kind of ensure a certain level of motion clarity performance throughout that refresh range, and that's called variable overdrive. Um, so it's exciting that we actually have that even at this very, very low price point. 99% sRGB coverage as well, along with also height adjustment. That's a really, really strong package again for 220 bucks. I'm a big fan of it. Um, there's also another model here. I'm just gonna note that we recently also came out with, which is gonna be the Tough Gaming 1440p based option for 250. Um, and we actually even have a kind of similar variant of that 1080p monitor that I just talked about actually at 190, so even less, but it's a, uh, it's a little bit less bright. Still all those things that I talked about, but no height adjustment. So even if you didn't necessarily need the height adjustment and you want to save a little bit of money, 190 bucks for that other monitor is just outstanding in terms of the value. But here's one other option that I just want to drop for you guys for somebody maybe is looking to finally upgrade to 1440p, but has a pretty limited budget. There's the VG27AQ3A, which just came out, and that's 27 inches, 1440p, 180 hertz. Also supports that fast IPS panel type. The variable overdrive has even higher 
uh, color space performance at 130% sRGB and 250 bucks. I think that's a really, really solid deal. That's actually competing with some of, let's just say the uh, non-brand, I think monitor vendors that you might find on certain e-tailers uh, where we are a proven leader within the gaming space as far as offering, I think a quality product monitor that of course, you know, um, you know, you know who Asus is, right? So it's definitely something that I would consider. Again, two great options. Again, 1080p or 1440p not being too expensive. Of course, we've got lots of other monitors that are quite a bit more expensive, but these are just two recent additions that kind of might slip under the radar because they're actually pretty low in price and they're not going to see a lot of visibility. Although I will tell you, I'm actually working with a couple media to try to get some reviews on these units because I think they're really solid value props for their respective price point. Okay. So. Uh, let me go ahead and quickly see if there was any quick questions there before we go to the next one. We jump in there. Um, just quickly see right there. <clears throat> so there's no R, um, RGB version this time. Oh, so Zach, if you're talking about actually for the external M.2 SSDs, that's correct. No, actually RGB for that external M.2 SSD. That one is under the Tough Gaming, no RGB lighting. If you guys actually, <clears throat> excuse me, want RGB lighting, check out the RG Arion. Oh, hey, wow, we've got Bad Z Tech joining us, man. Uh, hey, one of the best uh, creators out there right now. If you guys are not subscribed and checking out actually Bad Seed, make sure to go and check him out. And he actually recently just took a look at the world's fastest gaming monitor with the RG Swift 540 hertz. Um, I think he's probably still a little bit on team 1440p ultra high refresh rate. He's using the same AQN, which is my daily driver that I also I love. But I think he was also able to see some of the really impressive things that we were doing that I think break the convention of saying that TN is not going to be really solid for colors, right? And that it doesn't have a place still at offering the fastest pixel response time when you talk about LCDs. So you can check out a great overview and video that he did actually touching on that 540 hertz monitor. He's also got reviews that he did on our 1440p as well as um, our 27 inch OLED. So great kind of space if you want to kind of find out about some of the latest and fastest monitors that we're making. A great creator to check out. So you guys should check him out. And thanks for joining us on the stream, Brian. Appreciate it. So uh, we've gone through, of course, that new A21 chassis, the new Wi-Fi 7 router. We've also gone ahead and touched on, of course, the ROG Hone XXL desk mat. So that's an awesome desk mat that we added in. So now let's just go ahead and bake in a couple of other little quick updates that we've got for you guys here, just kind of rounding things out. So let me go ahead and jump into one is going to be the ROG Strix Flare 2, uh, excuse me, yes, uh, the ROG Strix Flare 2 Animate. So this, guys, it's not a new model. We've already had this out for a period of time. It's actually a um, great option right there if you want a full-size keyboard, right? So with 10 key, this one was when we introduced our RG NX switches, which are assembly lubed, nice high-quality switches. They're also binned for gram force deviation, which means that they're actually consistent between each switch. Actually, I don't know any other manufacturer that openly states that they bin their actually switches on their keyboard. Improved stabilizers, sound dampening foam, hot swap PCB, that cool anime matrix display that we've got on there, USB pass-through, which I actually really love USB pass-through on a, on a keyboard um, because I love being able to put things like my wireless adapter or things along those sides. And you can see kind of some of the cool customization that you can do with the Flare 2 Animate. But one of the cool things that we added in uh, for this model now is we actually now give you the tactile NX Brown switches. So originally we only had the red linears and then we had, of course, the blue for your guys that are clickies. And for, for those that were looking for the tactile option, we hadn't yet refreshed into that. But keep in mind, of course, it's a hot swap PCB. So you can go and swap out to your heart's content, um, you know, whatever switches you want. But the, the stock switches that come in there actually are quite nice. For some people, maybe you might want to lube them for a little bit more, kind of more smoothness, but pretty solid right off the bat. Um, next one is going to be the ROG Azoth. So uh, you guys have already kind of seen that the ROG Azoth, of course, that's kind of our flagship gaming keyboard. Um, we, of course, launched this a while back early originally in the year, but we just finished refreshing to the new Moonlight White version. And the new Moonlight White version also introduces our brand new ROG NX Snow and Storm switches. So this is a new box space switch, new type of housing material, even better factory lubrication. It sounds fantastic. It's really smooth. I really, in my opinion, there's no reason to um, change out these switches to another switch on the market. You still get that really cool OLED display. And you can actually get the first gen kind of variant with the ROG NX, which is right now even still on deal for 25 bucks off. Keep in mind some of the cool things with the Azoth that it comes with a full kind of accessory kit. So you get a lubing station, keycap puller, uh, 
um, an opener, a paintbrush, Crytox 205. Again, actually, you guys can actually check out a really good overview that um, that Bad Seed Tech actually did actually on the original Azoth. Um, hasn't looked at the new one, so keep in mind that when he's talking about switches, it would be for the original NX switches, not for the snow switches. But if you guys check out uh, Hepio Tech, Hepio Tech actually took a look at our Scope 296 that actually has the snow switches. Okay, um, so we have those eventually available in um, the black and the excuse me the black model is right now being refreshed to give you an option to go from the RG NX switches to the snow switches and the way that it works down is if I show you right here if you go to like our website for instance you can see right now blue red and brown so we have actually those three switches those are all the energy RG NX based switches and on the white model you've got the snow switches so the snow is going to be your linear the storm is going to be your clicky. And what you'll see right there is we're also now adding in for the white a brown. So you'll essentially have three options. You'll be able to go with your linear, you'll be able to go with your clicky, or you'll be able to go with your tactile. And on the black, um, we already talked about this previously, but it's being refreshed right now. So it's not yet available, but probably in the next week or two, you'll see the black variant be updated with the snow switches. So again, you can go either with the snow or you can go with the snow over the storm, essentially those new box switches that we have. So that's going to be the ROG Azoth. Okay. Um, let me go ahead and quickly check to see any kind of quick feedback that we might have right there. Mm, no good questions. All right. Fantastic. So let's go ahead and jump into our next item right here. So moving things along is going to be, um, let me see right here our Prime Series Gold Series PSUs. So let me go ahead and bring this up. So this is gonna be our most entry level PSU that we will be offering. Um, a really nice addition that we're gonna be having here. So again, if you have a more limited budget, but you wanna be able to get a solid quality power supply, eight year warranty, longer than standard cables compared to a lot of the more entry kind of PSUs. And that's great for a little bit more flexibility in cable routing, 750 watt, 850 watt Gold Series power supplies. Right. And again, ATX 3.0. So that means it fully could support, you know, uh, a 4080 or even a 4090, a modern generational build. You could 100 percent be good to go in here and you have to not have any kind of adapter cables. The cool thing with the Prime series is it's going to actually have a dual color design. So you actually can see that depending on how you flip the orientation of the PSU, you can actually have white or you can have black. It's got a really nice, just clean, refined design aesthetic. Again, there you can see the pinout connections you have available, including your 12 volt high power connection. So it's going to go ahead and get you covered right there. So this will be, again, the entry within our PSU lineup. The next model above that will be the Tough Gaming Gold Series, which has been out for now for a couple of months. Uh, that starts off from 750 watt and is going all the way up to a 1200 watt. Right now we only have the 1000 watt is the current highest model. 1200 watt will be coming in January timeframe. And then we also have the ROG Strix Aura Gold, which is also ATX 3.0. And those have just lit, hit in the last about two weeks. Again, that goes from 850 watt up to 1000. And we are actually gonna get ready right now to talk about the next model, which will be the 1200 watt, okay? So that is also gonna be another new product that we're gonna have right here, which is gonna be the ROG Strix Aura Gold, which will be the 1200 watt model. So we had already, of course, released the other models, right? So if we quickly recap right here, um, the RG Strix or Gold, again, you can get 750, 850, 1000, and 1200. Now, one of the really cool things about this power supply is gonna be the quality of the inbox cables. That's the same for the Tough Gaming. They have these beautiful, fully etched, modular cables um, that just look absolutely outstanding. Um, credit to Mr. Matt Lee right here. If I show you some of these cables, you're gonna see how they look but they have a really, really just nice, soft waxiness and malleability to them. So really easy to kind of route. There's no inline capacitor cables. So you don't have to spend money on extensions. These are really, really nice cables that come just straight inside the box. So I'm a big fan of these guys. It's I think one of our strongest value points for both the Tough Gaming model and for the ROG Strix model. They come with these fully etched modular cables. Also the ROG Loki, which is the SFXL PSU, comes with those same cables as well. Now, taking a look right here at the kind of the flagship side for the ROG Strix or before you get into a kind of our ultra flagship or premium uh, Thor models, which have like the wattage display, the newest model will be the 1200 watt. Here you're seeing the image for the 1000 watt, but I, 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 it looks identical. So there's no visual difference. This one adds in RGB lighting. It has a really cool, clean ID design. Do keep in mind that you do have to connect that RGB cable if you want it to sync with the rest of your system. So don't forget about that. 
but one of the most impressive things is this is absolutely the quietest PSU on the market. In their class, there's no other PSUs that get even close to them in terms of their overall performance. Um, it's absolutely insane how quiet these power supplies um, are. Now, in most situations, the power supply is probably gonna be operating in a zero dB operating mode, which means that when it's under load, it's not even going to be, um, excuse me, um, it's not even going to be, the fan's not even gonna be spinning. But one of the really cool things that we do is that the ROG series have actually larger heat sinks as well. And so that those larger heat sinks can natively just dissipate more heat as well, which gives us a benefit. But I wanna show right here, let's go ahead and quickly take a look at um, just one of the models here. So we're just gonna go ahead and look at one right here. So let's go over into our ore power supplies and let me bring up a model right here. So we'll, we can bring up the 850, or actually let's bring up the, the 1000. So let me go ahead and bring that one up here. For one second here. So here's our aura, should be it right here. So we're gonna go over to cybernetics, which of course you can check out the full test report for the power supply. But one of the really cool things that I love here is that you can see actually the noise graph. So let's look at this noise graph and let's just look how impressive this noise graph is. So right here, you're gonna see for the vast majority of people when they put together a system, their wattage footprint is gonna be between four, four to probably 500 watts. Um, it could even be under that, but it's probably gonna be somewhere between like 400 to maybe 500. If they've got a really heavy system and overclock, they could even be maybe 500 to 600 watts. But look at this, this red line right here is showing you that the actual dB, so the actual noise profile, it's, it's under six dB up to essentially about that almost 650 watts, which is absolutely crazy. It's a super quiet power supply. Um, it's so impressive, right? And then even right here, when we go into this 700 and 800, um, which this would be impressive for any power supply to still be this quiet where you're talking 10 to 15 and 15 to 20 dBA, you literally have to be breaching all the way into that 800 watts to even get into the 20 25 dba which is still effectively almost inaudible most other psus are going to start off in this range of being 20 25 dba 25 to 30 dba so um that's the proof is in the pudding of like the design differential of just how impressive that heatsink design is and the fan tuning that we have there so really really cool for the rog strix aura series so 1200 watt it's going to be coming in at 260 dollars but keep in mind again has that really premium performance the rgb lighting and of course those really nice inbox cables okay so let me quickly see um let me see if we got any feedback right here. Lando C goes, I'll never understand how JJ can keep track of every model in the feature fresh in his mind and remember where a lot of the review coverage has been published. I forget what I have for dinner. All good, man. You know, it's uh, that's my job, right? But um, yeah, again, also you guys will be able to see some great upcoming reviews, some, some great hardware that we're gonna have with Lando C. So again, make sure to go ahead and check them out. Mike Russo goes, good for a, a 4070 Ti, of course. Yeah, I mean, 1200 watt is actually, <laughs> Uh, really more than you need for any system for the vast majority of builders even for like a 4080 or 4090 my recommendation is using me an 850 to a thousand watt and if you're kind of really a super enthusiast user and you're heavily overclocking you've got a really high-end build then you could maybe consider going from that 1000 to a 1200 watt but um normal games don't even fully load that type of power profile in the GPU. So I can tell you like right here in this system, which I have, this is a 1300K, um, you know, here's of course 4090 right here, a tough gaming card. Uh, even if I put this under full CPU, excuse me, full power utilization with something like OCCT, which would never be a game, um, the breach, excuse me, the first initial inrush power is probably gonna be upwards of over a thousand watts, but it'll stabilize at probably below 900 watts. So again, even that really kind of high-end system, again, I'm not even getting to the thousand watts. So uh, you really don't need to be going that high, but it's that extra headroom for some people that they just wanna kind of have in place, right? Yeah, so Alex Wissers goes, I have no idea PSUs were noisy. I have a Thor 112 watt. Well, part of the reason why you didn't think they were noisy is because the Thor is actually very similar like that. This power supply is even quieter than the Thor, but the Thor actually was one of those really kind of focused models on the high-end side where we also add, add in those really high-performance heat sinks. So the actual Thor is very, very impressive in terms of its acoustic footprint as well. Um, and pretty much in most situations, you're never going to hear it. So that's actually one of the premium points of buying a power supply like the ROG Strix or the uh, Thor series power supplies, okay? All right. Um, so 
we're almost uh, finished up here, guys. Let me go ahead and go into the last items that we got right here. So the last one that I've got for you is going to be the Pro WS TRX50 Sage. So this is going to be for those of you that, of course, are probably not gamers, but actually might be on that professional side of the fence. Actually, we've got one other item right there that I don't want to forget about. But this is going to be for Threadripper and Threadripper Pro. So if you guys want to find out about these motherboards, check out the full in-depth live stream that we did that we talked about Threadripper Pro, TRX50, WRX90. Those are the chipsets for Threadripper Pro. Um, now, could you game on this? 100% yes, but this is really for those that are going to be doing really the highest level of content content production workflows. So you're doing advanced, you know, uh, raw, uh, excuse me, raw production workflows. So whether you're doing HDR based photography, um, we're not even talking about 4K, you're talking about 4, 6, 8, 12K video production workflows, 10 bit raw uncompressed workflows, right? You're doing science and simulation, a uh, science and simulation um, work, um, you know, AI analysis, right? You know, advanced, you know, science and simulation and, and physics modeling, all kinds of kind of really interesting things like that. That's what this platform is really intended to, because of course you have a huge number of cores. You of course have high density memory support with of course a higher number of channels available to you. I mean, this board can support up to a terabyte worth of memory at this point, right? Uh, you also have extensive PCI lanes, right? With of course all those PCI Express lanes being provided from the CPU. Um, into this board so you could be running multiple GPUs, multiple things like a, a high speed adding card. I mean, we've got things like, you know, the Hypergen 5 adding card here. This is a board that is perfectly suited for this because you need a by 16 slot to fully engage four, that's right, four PCI Express Gen 5 M.2 SSDs. This card would be perfect to pair with a motherboard like that because, of course, the high number of PCI lanes that we have from the CPU, right? So, you're going to essentially have this type of model right here with the Pro WS TRX50. This is going to be coming in at $899 in terms of its price point. Again, if you're looking for a premium offering, right, to be able to build really the highest level kind of production workflow type system, uh, workstation type system, then this is a board that you're going to be looking for. We'll have more information very soon on the people that even want to go bigger than this and they want to take advantage of the WRX90 platform, which of course goes even to a bigger motherboard that even has more PCI Express slots on it, right? So this is more for, I'd say, the traditional kind of enthusiast workstation user, although this will support both Threadripper and Threadripper Pro series CPUs and also to support overclocking uh, both for both the CPU and actually for the memory, which is also new uh, compared to in the past for kind of these workstation platforms where traditionally you don't usually have overclocking support for the memory and for the DRAM. All right. Uh, the last option that, I, excuse me, the last item that I got for you guys here is going to be the Zen Wi-Fi hybrid right here. And uh, did I actually make a, a slide for this one? Or did I forget it? Um, I will put it in there, but this is going to be coming in at 140 or 260. And the big difference here is that if you're in a situation or you've got a home where maybe you've tried mesh out um, and maybe you've had inconsistent results or it hasn't provided you the best experience, with the hybrid solution, the really cool part about this is this actually uses Mocha. If you're not familiar with Mocha, what Mocha actually is, is going to be coax based cable. So essentially the benefit is, is that in a lot of homes, especially in North America, you might have coax cable for like things like cable coming into your home. So if you have essentially coax running through your house from like one floor to another, you can use that to connect these two nodes together as your backhaul. So if you remember way back in the beginning part of the stream where we were talking about the router and we were talking about like having a wireless backhaul or an ethernet backhaul, maybe you don't have wired ethernet in your house, but maybe you have coax in your house. So you could actually connect these two together and the really impressive part is that the Mocha can support up to 2.5 gigabits of a backhaul connection with no degradation in performance, where if you talk about doing a wireless backhaul, your speed actually goes down over range, right? So the further away your, your node is, your secondary node that's going to be connecting wirelessly, it might start at kind of one speed, but it'll go down, go down, and go down. That's just the reality of, of course, wireless technology as opposed to a hard light connection, which maintains stable across its distance. So whether it's at 10 feet, 50 feet, or 100 feet, it's gonna give you one gigabit if it's a one gigabit in the cable, or 2.5 gig, it's gonna give you 2.5 gig. And this Mocha is gonna give you that as well. So this is a really cool item that we have that's giving you the flexibility to essentially set up 
your wireless environment with really good coverage. You can see right here, one unit would cover you up to 2,400 square feet. Two units right there is gonna give you up to 3,500 square feet. And like I said, you don't have to worry about kind of RF noise or competing wireless environments or other issues, maybe thicker wall environments, things like that. Um, you know, you might be in a situation where you're just constrained that wireless doesn't work well for you. And this could be a viable alternative that you have available to you with a Mocha-based setup. So you can take advantage of those coax cables, then be able to set things up and then be able to have a really nice, strong and performant Wi-Fi network as well as a wired network. Because again, remember, this is also a router. It's not just a mesh product. So again, if we go back here, you can still see that you do have an ethernet port on there so you could connect another device or you could connect a switch to it. So if you wanted more ethernet ports. So um, one model comes in at 140 and then two models comes in at 260. So you save a little bit of money if you buy two, uh, essentially the two pack versus the sing single pack. Um, and this one, again, should be available by the end of the month. And um, if I, I believe I showed it to you in the past, but I'll show it to you really quickly here. But we also do have our Mocha adapter, which is just a standalone uh, Mocha adapter if you wanted to be able to run coax over, uh, excuse me, ethernet over coax. So this is a standalone little adapter that you can buy for up to 2.5 gigabit base networking, right? That we have available $100. Um, so if you want to be able to essentially do that and make that work with your other products, you can actually take advantage of that. So if you had maybe a pre-existing router and you didn't want to wire directly into that router, maybe you wanted to buy a Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 6E router, Wi-Fi 7 router, but you wanted to use the Mocha, you could use this adapter, run over coax and be able to do that. So it's actually a pretty cool option that we also have available to you there. Um, so let me just see right there. Okay, so I don't, don't think that we've got any other quick questions that came right here. Tech Spirit at Ghost has one question right here. Um, I know I'm too late to class, but regarding the ROG uh, Azoth Moonlight White, I finally got one yesterday. I mean, fantastic Tech Spirit. That's a fantastic keyboard. I absolutely think it looks great. And those snow switches, did you get the star, storm switches or did you get the snow switches? Which one are you? Team Clicky or Team Linear? I'm all about quiet and smooth, so I prefer my linear switches, but all of them are really solid options, all right? Um, so... All right, guys, that's going to be wrapping up our stream. I'll quickly take a look here if I got a last question. Sorry we didn't get to a PCI Audio Builder Spotlight. We will definitely do the PCI Audio Builder Spotlight in the next stream that we have. So no worries about that. And also make sure to keep tuned to the PCI Audio group. We're going to have an exciting end of the year giveaway. We're going to try to do a push to get to 50K for our community group. So we're going to have some cool prizing that I've gone ahead and already confirmed. So if you're in the U.S. and you're in Canada, get ready. We've got some cool prizing to be able to go ahead and end the year out strong. Thank you guys for joining us for the stream. Let me quickly just see if we had a last question come in there. Uh, Michael goes, is the AR4, excuse me, the AIO 420, the Pro LC 420 cooler going to be available this month? Probably not. It might be available maybe in the very last week of this month, but probably the actual channel availability is going to be next month. So in January. So um, if it doesn't happen by the end of this month, uh, for sure it will launch in January. So make sure to keep it tuned. Okay. Um, Tech Spirit said he got the snow switches. Fantastic. I would agree. So overall, very cool, guys. Thank you guys so much. If anything else comes up, feel free to go ahead and tag me in the group. Or you can also go ahead and tag Lee. He, Lee's a little bit out right now because he's actually uh, moving. So best of wishes to Lee in terms of getting settled into his new home. But he'll be back in the community on Monday. So uh, if anything happens, also I'll spot check it this weekend as well. Feel free to go ahead and tag me in the group. You can also always email pcdowyateasus.com or hit us up on our social channels. So with that, guys, take care. Take it easy. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And thanks for joining us on our stream. Bye-bye, guys.